Invest in changing your world. You can harness your will and transform a nation. You are an impact thinker. The winner circle is created for you because you were designed by the creator to win. Rise up and be the dream and then dream bigger. This is the beginning of something revolutionary. There is greatness waiting for you. You are empowered to win. Hi, I'm Apostle T.B. Walker, and I want to welcome you once again to Empower to Win. Certainly want to once again just appreciate everyone who has been watching and following and sharing uh, this, these Empower to Win segments. We certainly appreciate you and your support. Uh, today or this morning or this evening, whenever you're actually going to be viewing this, I want you to know what the topic of the, the conversation that we're going to have today. Uh, ain't no such thing as halfway crooks. Now, when you look at that, this term was actually made popular by a group called Mob Deep. I used to love Mob Deep uh, back in the day. Uh, and it comes from one of their um, hip hop albums, uh, Shook Ones. One of the songs they had, Shook Ones. And the term that's used there actually describes an impossibility, uh, an oxymoron, if you will. It implies that, that either you are or you are not a crook. That's really what it's about. You can't steal a little bit and be kind of like a kind of crook or a partial thief. It doesn't work that way. Therefore, a halfway crook is an impossibility. So now, how does this connect to what we're talking about? How does this connect to the kingdom and the church? Well, there are plenty of people that look at money and talk about that money has nothing to do with my worship. That's their mindset. Uh, you know, so therefore, you can't call me a crook. So I want to just talk a little bit about that. You know, some of the church have developed this corrupted disease takers mentality that's shrouded in a type of spirituality that is based on convenience without any investment. You know, the theme of the life of so many of the believers is how much can I get from God with making the least amount of investment possible? I want to make a little bit of an investment, but I want to get the most out of the Lord. They're in church to get what they can get from the church. And right, because so many people look and say, well, that's what the church is for, right? That's what it's really all about. And so people have just gobbled up this idea of abundance. They love to hear about overflow, increase. And they're asking, what's the easiest way to go to get to the promises of God? I, need, I want those blessings that are spoken of in the word, but I want to really try my best to do this with the least amount of sacrifice that I can possibly make on my part. I want God to do his part and just blow me up, but I want to make the least amount of investment I can make on my part. So I want you to understand something. That's a poisonous mindset. And when giving is about getting, then what you have is you're in danger of your giving becoming contingent upon getting. So therefore that person's willingness to actually give is connected directly to the wrong wires. So it has nothing to do with faith, has nothing to do with the Bible, has nothing to do with gratitude. It's all about profit or loss. So when you look at that, it's really a business transaction. You know, people coming to the, give an offering, little or a major offering, but the mindset is that it's a, it's a business transaction. And many people in the church have begun to employ Wall Street principles, somehow expecting to get kingdom worship out of a Wall Street principle, and that doesn't work. So with this mindset and with this type of thinking, people can actually become thieves by commission. That's with what you do, that's what you did, or by omission, which is what you withheld. Now, the commission is what you unlawfully did. That's the thief by actually committing an act that's unlawful. The omission is by unlawfully withholding something that you're actually supposed to give. So here's the truth. There, there are plenty of people who complain that the church is always after their money. And here's the thing, they're actually partially right. You know, the church is the recipient of their money, but the church is, and this is the truth of the matter, the church isn't actually after their money, but God most certainly is. And, and let me tell you why he is, because our hearts are bound up in our treasure. You know, God wants our hearts and he wants us to be devoted to him. And, and listen, when you begin to look at this, a heart that sees giving to God, and this is for the believer, because this, this cannot happen with an unbeliever. We have no expectation that an unbeliever is even going to see this. But when a believer gets to the point 
where they begin to think that giving to God is a subtraction from the quality of their lives, there's a heart problem. Listen, the fact that a believer would actually resent the idea of giving according to the command of God, that actually tells you right now that that believer has a weak, vulnerable heart condition and that needs to be changed. Here's the truth. Giving is a privilege and it's a responsibility for those who have actually received God's gift of eternal life. The church is not designed in any way to be financed by the government. It's not designed to be financed by grants. It's not designed to be financed by various world systems, churches or other church related ministries are, are not supposed to, nor should they have to appeal to unbelievers to finance the operation of God's church. That's just ridiculous. So when you look at th third John and I want you to look at the, this is John three, uh, no third John chapter seven and here's what at verse seven, here's what it says. They went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles giving should be a thank offering to God and a person outside of Christ cannot properly give that thank offering to God. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 13 verses 15 through 16. Here's what it says. Therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips that confess his name. That's verse 15. Here's 16. Do not neglect to do what is good and to share for God is pleased with such sacrifices. So when you look at this, you can you can see here that there is a motive and a purpose and, and, and a privilege that's given specifically to the believers in terms of their sowing, in terms of their sacrifices, in terms of their giving. Now, there are certain people, I'm sure, that are looking and saying, well, listen, you don't know my financial situation, Apostle. I, I, I love God, but I just can't afford to sow. Well, listen, one of the things you got to understand and get in your head right now, giving is an ordinance commanded by God set up by God, but also an opportunity for believers to worship. And it should be done by every single believer. Listen, poor Christians, as well as rich Christians, are supposed to give unto the Lord because poor Christians and rich Christians are supposed to worship the Lord. And our giving is a part of worship. And the scriptures bear this out, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that they have declared that even if you can't give much, you aren't exempt from this area of participating in worship. Now, look at Luke chapter 21, verses one through four. And I'm going to read this for you. And he looked up and that he is Jesus and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in two mites. And he said of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow has cast in more than they all for all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, right? This is giving. But she of her penury, of, of, of her poverty, has cast in all the living that she had. First of all, I want you to understand Jesus was right there watching and he did not stop her. I want you to notice that. He doesn't come and say, hey, you only have this amount. Don't give it into the treasury of the temple. Don't sow that into the kingdom, uh, into the Lord. No way. No, no, he didn't stop her. Matter of fact, he, he, he doesn't stop her. He allows her to do it. And then when she walks away, he says that she gave more. He looked at this woman and actually said uh, that she was actually more blessed than those who gave out of their abundance. The giver of every good and perfect gift which is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. He knew her struggle, he, but he also saw her willingness and pronounced a blessing over her life simply because of this act of worship. Listen, she valued worship. And guess what he did? Christ valued her offering and he, and he saw it as weighty and special. So the fact that we struggle doesn't mean that we're not supposed to give unto the Lord, nor does it mean that our struggle isn't actually set up to be an opportunity for sacrificial faith. Listen, I want you to understand this. We can actually eat our money without knowing it. And by doing that, in some cases, we can eat our blessing. Listen, I read an article the other day and there's a, you know, there are people out there who have this rare illness, this rare disease, which uh, gives them this compulsion to consume money, specifically change. And um, there was a man who had, had eaten 
I mean, he had just gobbled up all of these coins and he had gone into the hospital because he had gotten sick. And they thought that he had this huge cancerous mass in his stomach, in, in, actually in his guts. And when they went in to do surgery, what they found was 20 pounds of metal coins that were actually in his stomach. This man had eaten $700 worth of coins. The, the mass that he had had changed his life. It had absolutely deformed him. And eventually he died from eating his own money. He died from eating money. And so when you begin to look at this, this same disorder that you see here in this man can actually be seen in this believer and, and well in believers. And I want you to ask yourself, are you gorging yourself sick with desires to have money and material, more material things? You know, I mean, is, is, are you eating up your money so much so that you have nothing left but scraps to invest in the Lord? Listen, just, I mean, I want you to just stop for a moment and just take inventory of your life because this is important. How much time are you sacrificing away from your family and away from church and away from the very purposes that God has given you life for simply because of money? And, and before you're actually tempted to, to tune this out and say that that can't be me, let me turn this off. Uh, you know, all these pastors want to do is just talk about money. I want to stop you right there in your tracks. Listen, one of the convictions and one of the tasks that God has given the leaders in the church is that we are to expound and to teach the full counsel of God's word. And if we're going to talk about the full counsel of God's word, we've got to be able to talk about money. Listen, 16 out of 38 of Christ's parables dealt with money. Money is actually spoken of in the New Testament more than heaven or hell combined together. Listen, it's said five times more than faith. It's talked about five times more than prayer. There are about 500 plus verses of both on faith and prayer. There are over 2000 verses that deal with money and possessions. So the question we've got to ask ourselves is why does Jesus talk about money so much? You know, and, and I'm going to say it again and I well, I'm going to say it again. But I, but Jesus actually said it much, much better than I could say it. So let me give you his words. We'll take out my words. Let's, let's use his words. Matthew chapter 6, 21. I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want to give you a revelation here. God is actually revealing to us by the weight of the discussion that our use of money and how we value our possessions may be one of the single greatest indicators of our spirituality. It may be a great indicator of where our heart is. And listen, money is never the problem. It's the love of money that's actually the issue. You know, somebody asked uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller. We, you know, we the, the Rockefeller from Rockefeller Center, the multi, multi gazillionaire. He, he asked John Rockefeller how much money he wanted. And here's what he answered. Just a little bit more. That's what he said. I just want a little bit more, you know, and this accurately describes not only Americans, but unfortunately, you know, whether we like to admit it or not, there are believers who looked at, at, at life in that very same way. That if I just had a little bit more money, I, th I think I'd be fine. You know, what, what do you really need out of life? Well, if I could just get this paid, that would be the thing that would bring me the greatest joy. And, you know, when we talk about this, I'm sure there are people that are absolutely turned off by this. And I have to admit. You know, there are ministers out here that have hustled harder than Pablo Escobar. No, no doubt about it. Listen, some of our TV evangelists, some of our, our, our people on these various networks uh, have, have been the biggest pimps and schemers, and they've given Christians a bad name. I get it. I totally understand it. Uh, and so because of this kind of abuse, there are a lot of pastors now that have become afraid to even talk about this. Leaders in the church, ministers uh, don't want to deal with money. We like to deal with laying on of hands and, you know, casting out demons and all these comfortable things that people, uh, you know, have literally are able to receive. But, you know, don't talk to me about my money. So what we have to do is understand that if we're going to teach the whole gospel, we're crippling the people. If we're not talking about money and listen, if you're true about the counseling that you're doing, if you really are, are honest about the, the some of the sicknesses that you're seeing in your church, some of those are because of our inordinate understanding of money. Some of us are staying up at night. Some of us are have high blood pressure and heart attacks. And so much of that is connected to this to money and to how we deal with it and how we see it. And I want you to understand that we need to make this clear. Scripture teaches us clearly about giving. 
But one of the things you've got to understand about giving, and I want to help some of the people that are up at night, that some of the pastors that are wondering, like, how are we going to survive? How are we going to make it? I don't want to offend anybody. Listen, one of the most important principles to keep firmly in your mind, and I hope you understand this, you need to understand whose money we're talking about in the first place. You know, as we're looking and talking about my money, her money, his money, you know, I want you to understand who we're talking about. It's not yours. The first thing you got to understand, it's not yours. If you are married, it is not your husband's money. It is not your, your wife's money. It is God's money. God's ownership of everything is a foreign concept to us. I, and, I, and I get it. We, we've gotten so far away from understanding that principle that we really think we give, we're doing God a favor when we give him some money. When we give back to God, we're really hooking him up. We're really helping him out. We're doing the Lord a solid. But what we don't understand is that it is not our money. We, we like to think these are our possessions, it's our money, but it's not. The Bible makes it clear that God owns everything. All things were created by him and for him. That's, first Col that's Colossians 1 and 16. Everything actually belongs to God. That's the truth. To the Lord your God belongs the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. That's Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. That's his. That's Psalm 50, verse 10. The world is mine and all that is in it. That's Psalm 50, verse 12. So I want you to understand that God said the silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord. That's Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. I just want you to understand so we can make it clear that this is not your money. So you listen, we live in a generation and I, and I need you to understand where God is really trying to take us here because this may start out to be very, very critical, but God wants to do something in this generation. You know, we live in a time where apathy is, is not the exception. It's actually the norm. You know, we, we are well known, especially in America. We're well known for our lack of interest, our lack of accountability, our, our irresponsibility. You know, who cares? We, we're, we're known for that attitude. And as I've stated before, and I'm sure many of you know this, researchers have said this is the most biblically illiterate generation generation in history and we must change that the Lord has commanded believers to love him with our whole heart soul mind and strength and that includes our finances that includes every resource that we have and it is not a suggestion it's not a good thing to do it's a command by God and God is calling this generation those that are hearing me right now to fulfill the true purpose that Christ has designed his people for. This is appeal. This is a direct appeal to a generation to live up to that purpose and actually become who they were destined to become. It's really all or nothing. The reality is this is not about a portion. You know, how much should I give? You know, what, 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 what portion of me should I give to the Lord? Listen, this is a rally cry to, to some of you that are willing to hear this right now. That is to stir us up to either give God everything that he has commanded of us or give him nothing. A generation that we and I believe that God is looking for a generation that's simply not looking for him to no longer just be a part of their lives. You know, I've got this, this, this and Jesus. No, man, or Jesus. Jesus is number one and I've got these other things. No, Jesus wants to be the very center of our lives. He wants to guide our giving. And so, you know, when I take to heart and when you take to heart the truth that God has an ownership claim, not only on the few dollars we want to throw into the offering plate, not the 10 percent or 15 percent or 50 percent of our money, but God has a absolute ownership claim over 100 percent of his money. He doesn't have it over my money, over his money. And when we get that, you're going to see that it's, it's going to change our lives. It's meant to be life altering. You know, suddenly when I understand that principle, we move from the place of disorder to order and everything that was ordained to flow from God into my life now can flow. I'm no longer holding on to money like I own it. And so here's what, it, what happens. I don't actually have to be God. I can be God's money manager, which is what I'm supposed to be, because that's what a steward is. We don't own it. We're stewards. So the flow begins when things are in order. God is in his place. Wonderful. I am in my place. Wonderful. Money has now been put in its place. Wonderful. Not only does God own everything, but guess what? God also controls everything. And here's the revelation. And I want you to get this. Your money is in better hands in God's hands than it is in your hands. 
That's really what that's all about. When we understand the control and the sovereignty of God, it offers us this freedom when things seem out of control. It's in his hands. So when I grasp that I'm a manager and not an owner, it totally changes the perspective. It, this is the true, this is the ultimate paradigm shift. So suddenly we're not asking this question, how much of my money shall I give to God? That question is really out. I'm no longer asking about that question, my money. It is really now, Lord, since this is your money, how much do you want me to invest? What do you want me to do with it? The question here isn't theoretical. It isn't theological. We're, we're not theologically uh, confirming or affirming uh, the ownership that God really has. The question is whether we are literally, deliberately, purposefully transferring that which we were holding thing that made us stress us out, trying to be God, trying to be owners instead of man managers. Have we taken the transfer and taken that out of our hands and transferred it into his hands? Listen, this self-surrender that we're actually talking about today is the beginning of true stewardship. This is the relationship where God can begin to trust us with more, with more resources. So to make it real, here's the thing. It's not a surrender that's just done on a Sunday morning. It's a surrender that has to be done every single day. And if we're not surrendering, the Bible says you can't serve two masters. You're going to either love one or hate the other. So there's some people that love crying out unto the Lord. There's people that love praying unto the Lord. They're really, really good about attendance, but they're holding back their substance. They're holding back and they don't think they're crooks. But I need you to understand today, ain't no such thing as halfway crooks. You, you, need, you need to get that. You need to understand there's no such thing as halfway crooks. Either you're in, either you're out, either you're real, either you're not, either you're a true worshiper or you're not. And God said, I'm looking for, I'm coming after, I'm seeking those who worship me and in spirit and in truth. And the fact that we're supposed to give ourselves unto the Lord is absolutely true. So I want you to examine that today. And I don't want you to walk as a crook any longer. I want you to support the kingdom and the things of God and understand he's in control. So no matter what's going on, what no matter happens with the money, what happened with my gift, what happened with your heart, that's what you really need to ask. So I want you to understand this. You're empowered to do what I'm talking about, but there may be things around you that are, that are trying to stop you that seem like hindrances. I want you to know this, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's going on around you, you just need to remember this, you are empowered to win.